a little shiny today. A little shiny. A little shiny. I need makeup. 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 No, oh, there's nobody Wait. here. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. You do those here stupid videos where, and then it's like, <laughs> you know, two seconds later, it's Ding! like, it's like this. <laughs> you know, I hate yeah. that shit. I hate that shit so much. Oh, it's so bad. <laughs> and, episode 2.5 oh wait are you recording dude i've been recording this whole time oh really yeah i'm gonna use all sure? that shit against you all that <laughs> oh yeah. great I'm, I'm oh i'm sure i'll throw some of that in um yeah here okay let's try that again so hey <laughs> i feel like will ferrell and uh like <laughs> snl what he's doing carry carry hey yeah, yeah. <laughs> episode 2.5 <laughs> no. no uh so yeah episode 2.5 i think uh, it's technically not up i guess it's episode three but it's a continuation of the last one because we had such a great conversation with mr robert Russler. we did we did we had a great conversation a uh, big part of it's missing but we'll we'll get back to that uh, yeah Matt, yeah and get so, him back on and fill that in so one thing about uh us doing this is we've been learning we've been learning uh learning. and so we've had some technical difficulties in the first couple episodes, and hopefully after today's episode, that will end. Although the, the footage from the continuation of Robert Russler's interview does have issues because we didn't know how to stop it from going single screen on, on specific people. And it, it's kind of annoying, but neither of us want to lose this entire interview because of that. So we're going to tolerate it for part two of this interview. But from now on, we're going to keep it at all times, everybody on the screen at the same time. It's, it's a lot better to be able to see everybody's reactions. And, and we never intended, when we were watching it, we were seeing all three of us. But then when we downloaded the file, it was one at a time. And we were having some sound issues. Chris's mic was a little touchy on desk there and it was reverberating. <laughs> and I realized my, my good friend Lawton, who was the one who told me to buy this mic to begin with, he was like, dude, your mic just doesn't sound right to me. So he had me get on a Zoom chat with him and he said, show me your mic. And he realized I had it. See, this, well, the blue light is supposed to be pointing towards me. I had it this way. <laughs> so I actually now have the mic pointing towards me. So I should Hooray. be sounding better. We're learning. We're learning. We yeah. apologize for the the second half of the, of the, like Sean said, the second half of the Rustler interview is going to be slightly maddening. But there's some great material in there, like he said, we didn't want to lose. So bear with us for this one. And the next one will be way better. And we're yeah. ironing it out. I'm spending lots of time online um driving myself mad looking up information because i'm an idiot so we'll get there <laughs> but we're working on it and hopefully this one works and uh very exciting and now i'm mean, in a different place different room and uh, uh no that's not fun. true that's not true you completely remodeled that room you're in just for the I did. fans i did he built this he built this corner facade and put yeah. it's yeah he's, it's in uh, my backyard this is all a facade it's a set <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm just noticing that Derek Riggs uh, artwork. I have that exact same print. Oh, do you? That's, That's the, the one I bought. One. That's the yeah. one I bought too. Yeah. yeah, it's awesome. So we already have. I mean, the first episode's only been up at this point of this conversation about 24 hours, but we already have some questions and some comments of m mistakes we made. There's and plenty we, of those. I'm and sure. we own we own those mistakes. Oh, dude, you don't get better unless you make mistakes. I mean, yeah. So. Yeah. I want to know how to learn good. Uh, so calm down, Rich. See, I'm also going to say the people's names now because last time you're asking, who, who asked that question? I was like, I don't know. So okay. calm down, Rich. That's his handle. Mm -hmm. Said, great job, fellas. Looking forward to the next episode. Or is it a continuation? Question mark. Episode 2.2. .2. Oh, he, he was... I haven't even read this yet. And, you know, he's on the same wavelength. He said, by the way, it's Vin Scully, who was the yeah. voice of the Dodgers, not Chick Hearn. <sighs> yep. 
my bad. See, I'm not. Uh, Chick Kerm was the Lakers guy. Yeah. Vin Scully was Dodgers guy. Well, yeah. that shows you how much I care about sports. I mean, you're looking yeah. at a guy who I don't care. <laughs> but those you, guys were cool. But you had a dead old guy. You were close. <laughs> <laughs> I do know. a lot of quoting of dead old guys. I yeah. noticed that about myself lately. He said, but yes, Chuck Woolery was two and two. So that I got that part right. There you go. All right. Two and two. Um, Dr. Wolfenstein, Ooh. he said, it's the Panaglide, fellas. Panaglide. I said, you said, what did you say at first? You said something, and then I said Pana something, but I was wrong, too. I got closer. We inched you closer. Did. You were closer, yeah. Uh, I, don't I don't remember what I said. I think I said uh, Panaflex. Ah, thank you for that. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks. for No, it's, hey, no, it's we got to make hey, sure man. we get the shit right. Get it right. Steve uh binger wants to know what our the top, bingster the bingster wants to know what our top five favorite movies are i guess he's just saying top five favorite Jeez. movies in general that is something hard. you got to think about that yeah that's hard it's easier when you when you subgenre it for me overall that's i just, I just love movies i could and that changes daily like yeah yeah well i mean do you have an all-time favorite film though you've got to have like when somebody goes, what's your favorite movie of all time? You got to have an answer. I have an answer. What is it? The Shining. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think, it, well, I, I'll be honest with you. It does flip-flop. <laughs> it flip-flops between The Shining and Clockwork Orange. I told you. I told you. Oh, Clockwork Orange. Yeah. I told you. It changes every day. It changes yeah. for me every day. But uh, yeah, well, um, What's it feeling like this week? I love a movie called 12 Angry Men. One of my favorite movies. Hmm. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen it. Oh, you should see it. Oh, it's so good. What year? Uh, uh, that was back in the, was it 50s, 60s? Yeah, 50s? I was going to say it's an it's, old movie, right? It's an old movie. So. 12 Angry Men is one of my favorites. Yeah, I saw the um, one with the monkeys, but I didn't see the Angry Men one. <laughs> but the 12 Monkeys. The 12 Monkeys, yeah. Uh, that's, that's, I don't know. There's so many. I'm a big fan of the Road Warrior. It's like a go-to. Mad Max Road Warrior? Too. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's one of my favorites. Shining, yeah. for sure. I mean, Shining's a masterpiece. That thing is just yeah. unbelievable. Um, God, oh, this movie. Oh, look at this. How funny. I was staring at the vinyl. Oh, you know, I've never seen Sorcerer. Oh, it's so good. It's a remake, but it's so good. Yeah. Top five. I guess that's your top five desert island thing. Is that right? Is that how that works? I don't know. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, if I had to think of that, I guess I'd, I'd be the Shining... Clockwork Orange, uh, Blade Runner. I'm a Blade Runner fan. Uh, I love Blade Runner, but it wouldn't be top five for me. No, no. Kiss meets the Phantom of the Park. <laughs> <laughs> no, I definitely don't want to spend the rest of my life on a desert <laughs> island having to watch that Star Child. Star Child. <laughs> um. Uh, you know, as much as I love Halloween, I don't think it would be in the top five. Uh, I mean, it would be in my top 10 favorite horror films of all time, but I don't yeah, think it would sure. be in my top 10 favorite movies. I mean, I'd probably go with something like Dazed and Confused might be in there. Really? Uh, yeah, I love Dazed wow. and Confused. Wow. Maybe Jaws. Jaws. Yeah. Oh, uh, Jaws is up there. Sure. Uh, Dawn, of the the Dawn of the Dead. Dawn of the Dead. Raiders of the Lost Ark is in there. Yeah, Raiders, Raiders would be in my top twenty-five, probably. Oh wow, you're really, you're really, yeah, you're getting deep. Empire Strikes it. Back. Ah, that's a good one too. Yeah, I know. That's a good one too. Troll Two. Troll Two. Yeah, <laughs> Ghoulies go to college. Ghoulies, Ghoulies go, go to college. Go, yeah, sure. Um, Leprechaun in space. Yeah, or in the hood whichever i mean they're both epic wherever he's at he's taking care of business or the spookies i don't know if you've seen the spookies the spookies sure yeah another epic epic film i like it spooky so bad um <laughs> pumpkin head two blood wings i don't know <laughs> did that uh, answer your question <laughs> yeah all right um let's see so i had another i got a message from uh, uh this was really nice from a guy named anthony who said mm -hmm. your YouTube channel has become destination viewing. What you and Nelson are doing is something real and special. Keep up the positive direction. Oh, yeah. that's, that, that's a, that's a good one. I like yeah. that. That's awesome. Um, he, and he said, uh, I've had COVID. 
It's no Ooh. joke. I'm a first responder. I've lost one coworker to it and my coworkers have lost parents to it. I don't wish it upon anyone. He's been donating to the Red Cross for anyone who's had it and recovered and may qualify to donate plasma to those who are on ventilators. If anyone's watching and has recovered, please reach out to them. Apparently donated plasma with COVID antibodies that are donated can get people off a ventilator within 24 hours of receiving the plasma. Mm. Uh, so he just want, you know, if anybody out there has mm. had it and recovered mm -hmm. and you can contact the Red Cross and donate, donate, you know, it can help people. So that's, that's cool. But he did have a question. What is the first moment you stopped and said, wow, all of my hard work is bringing joy to other people. I know you both are constantly busy, but just know the joy your work provides for others. That was really sweet. Um, that is a sweet, wow. That was a sweet yeah. message. Yeah. Wow. Anthony Landry. Thank you, Good Anthony. To answer his question, when was the first time that you kind of said, wow, you know, like something I've been doing seems to be making some sort of impact on people or significance? Um, it's strange. That's a good question. Because that, that ultimately ended up being the reason why I do everything in my occupation and working in film. Before it was, you know, oh, I want to make art and make a living at it for the longest time. I think it was only until way later in my career that I realized once you start having <clears throat> quote unquote fans, I guess, or, you know, people recognize the more you work on films that are a little get more exposure and and people see more of your work then people start coming up and going oh you did this makeup or you worked on that that was what really when i started realizing it was much later in my career i'd say within the last 10 years um five five ten years did i realize it really helps people and then getting you remember messages. what the specific thing was uh, yeah, um, you know i don't um and that's how much it meant to him, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just became such a personal thing. Yeah. Me. You know, I don't, I don't remember exactly what it was. I think, mm -hmm. I think around the time American Horror Story, when I was working on American Horror Story, there were so many fans and people would really like it. And some of those characters became kind of iconic in, 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 the, in that world. And I think going to some conventions or wherever, people were like, oh, this makeup or oh, that makeup or oh, this season. That's when I really realized there was a following of sorts, you know, that some of the Marvel movies I've done, like doing Nebula for a couple of few of those movies, you know, it's, it's when you start getting into movies where fans are really passionate, like Marvel or Halloween or American Horror Story well, or, you know. Halloween fans are passionate? Halloween fans are passionate. They're passionate. Hmm. Yeah. Um, they could up the game a little bit. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I think it's around that time when I, w I was like, oh, wow, this really, it makes people happy. And, and that's great. That's the only reason to do it. It's so great. You know? Yeah. How about you? I think the first time I realized anything I had done had an impact was my first band, 19, 20 years old. I was on a hardcore band called Yuck Mouth. And we did, we did a seven inch single and an album and, you know, we weren't by any means famous or, you know, just local, local band. But I remember getting a fan letter from Japan and it was a Japanese girl who mm. sent who I still have the letter, wrote this letter about how much she loved the band picture of herself. It was just, it blew my mind. I'm like, Oh my God somebody in friggin' Japan has heard our band. Oh, that's crazy <laughs> to me, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that's the first time I felt like, wow, something I did had some sort of impact. And then in this genre and the stuff that we're in nowadays, I think the first time I felt proud of being a part of something was the Halloween 25th convention because I wasn't representing people yet. I wasn't uh, making documentaries yet or I wasn't involved in any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And we put this event on that the people there were truly grateful for and loved. And, and it kind of opened my eyes to a whole nother world of, you know, I've always been the fan going to the conventions and I knew what that felt like. And to be just a guy and people mm -hmm. were coming up to me, thanking me all weekend. And I was like, wow, this is so cool. You know, I, I did something or I, had a part there were two other people involved with putting that show on but we did something together 
that had an impact. And it was, that was cool. It was cool. That's great. That was a good question. Thank you for that awesome message, that good question. And yeah, if you're out there and you can help anybody with anything during this terrible, terrible time, uh, do it. A lot of people working really hard out there and it's worse now than it's been. I don't know where it's all going to end, hopefully soon, but uh, we won't get into that. But yeah, get out there, help if you can, be safe. I also got this in the mail. A buddy of mine, Scott Pensa, who's a retired New York police officer, mm -hmm. he sent me one of his uh, challenge coins. You can see it there. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. I just thought that was really nice of him to send it to me as a as a as a gift. He he's a huge horror fan, and he's made challenge coins for horror stuff. Like he did uh, a phantasm one. Let's see. I'm trying to get this in the light. Of that. There it is. Yeah. It's got Angus on it. Oh, nice. And then he did one for Steve Dash. And Steve Dash gave this one to me as a gift before he passed. Oh. So it's got it's got him on it. It's Sackhead Jason, our favorite oh, Jason. Our favorite. You see it? Is yeah. it kind of coming through? Yeah. I see and it. then on the flip side, it has his, because he was an ex-New York cop also. Oh. So it's got his, see, Stephen Daskowitz. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. And then he's made some other things that are not coins, but... Um, what What is a challenge coin? I, I'm, not, I'm it, not familiar with that. It's something that like firefighters and police officers and they, they have them made and they give them to people that are close to them. Um, mm. I don't really know the origin of it. Mm. Okay. But he also made this one, which was like a badge from, for a maniac cop. Oh yeah. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, see? Nice. And then he also made this one that looks like a pop figure of Angus. He's a huge, he's a big Phantasm fan, Scott. Yeah, I can see that. That's yeah. cool. I don't know if he has any more of any of those. If somebody's like, where can I get them? But his name's Scott Pensa. He's mm. on Facebook. You can ask him. He did sell them, you know, had a limited run. Oh, I got a really cool gift yesterday. I'm going to share it just kind of shows a different side of of a horror icon oh. so yesterday i did a couple private signings with an autograph dealer that came into town we were all masked up we were all being safe but i did a signing with nick castle yesterday and then after i left nick's house i went and uh, we did a signing with tobin bell and tobin mm -hmm. brings in this little bag and he says i got you a gift i haven't seen tobin since this all nonsense started but he, a little card. He says this is for me and Nay, and it says "Expect a miracle." Oh! And and inside it says, "For Sean and Nay, we will emerge from this strange time the better for it." Onward, Tobin. Wow! Very cool. And he gave us this a little like hanging bell thing to put in the backyard. Oh wow! And I Lovely. didn't even really think about it till now. Tobin Bell. I didn't even think about it when he gave it to me till now. <laughs> would have never. I uh, I would have never. Wow. But it, just a sweet guy. That and, is uh, a sweetheart. That's a sweet gift and a sweetheart. And I would have never put the bells together because, honestly, I don't. I I didn't even know today was Sunday. Understood. I don't even know what day it is anymore. I'm sure a lot of you out there don't know what day it is. Check out my Mission Tiki drive-in collectible Ooh. glass Ooh. or cup. I went Thursday night and saw a double feature of the Lost Boys and Fright Night, and it was awesome. Beyond Fest was awesome. I have no complaints this time like I did the last time when everybody was honking and flashing their headlights. Mm -hmm. They finally put a PSA before the movie saying not to do it during the film. Good. Even though there's a couple of attention whores that just couldn't help themselves a couple times. Right. But for the most part, it was all good. Then it was just so much fun. Didn't you go to a drive-in last night? I'm Beetlejuice? supposed to go tonight. Oh, it's tonight. Tonight's Beetlejuice. Are you going? I think I have tickets. I just don't know if I'm going to go. Why? It's nice and hot. I can put the projector out in my backyard because I have a screen out there that I can roll. Come and on. Put and put on Beetlejuice and float around in my pool. And watch Dude, you can do that anytime, man. How often do you get to go to a <laughs> drive-in? A, a drive-in, like I dude, know. You go. It's the Rose Bowl too, and I know somebody. Go. That went, I know somebody that went the other day and said it wasn't all that. Well, yeah, go man. find out for yourself. I Gives will. you something to talk about next week. Yeah, 
That's true. Don't be a curmudgeon. Curmudgeon. And, uh, isn't that not that a word? Um, you know, sitting at home going, <laughs> ah, I can watch it in my backyard. You know? <laughs> I don't know if I sounded like that. You kind of felt that way. But yeah, go to Beetlejuice, man. I think you'll regret it if you don't. Now I'm kind of regretting not going. I had tickets for Big Trouble in Little China and Enter the Dragon, uh -huh. and I didn't go. And friggin' John Saxon dies yesterday. I could have saw uh, him on the big screen yeah. a few days ago and, and had a proper send off. I was a huge fan of John Saxon. Yeah. And you know, it's funny. I did a movie with Paul Giamatti once. Love Paul Giamatti. He's so cool. He's the coolest yeah. guy ever. And we had such a good time. He was a John Saxon fan too. And we would always really? talk about John Saxon. Yeah. And we would greet each other every morning on the movie going, Hey, John Saxon. We call each other John Saxon because we love John Saxon. So I go, Hey, John Saxon. Hey, John Saxon. Hey, John Saxon. We do it all day. And Did we you ever meet John? People nuts. I never met John Saxon. I always oh. wanted to because my first, I mean, my first real memory of John Saxon was $6 million man. Maskatron. Maskatron. And yeah. I was obsessed with that. When I did have Facebook, I think Maskatron was my profile picture for the longest time. <laughs> you know, and, that's uh, one figure that I, I've been wanting to add to the collection. Mm. I've been looking for a mint Maskatron in the box. Mm. You have one? Who hasn't? I don't. I have a Maskatron. It's not mint in the box. And I have a $6 million man. And I have the $6 million man's re-energy capsule whatever that capsule was that came like with the him. space shuttle thing the space shuttle yeah. thing and you put them inside and it's supposed yeah. to you know i have that too uh but he doesn't my six million dollar man figure doesn't have the latex mm. roll well, that comes out i'm gonna make one actually for him uh, uh i so. have a mint i mean absolutely flawless mint six million dollar man in the Ooh, box really and the last time I pulled it out, it, it still was rollable, but I got a feeling it's been a long time, you know, yeah. and thin latex like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably gone. I'm almost afraid to take it out because I have, I also have a uh, stretch monster in the box. And, oh. And yeah. I used to pull it out and massage it and stretch it just kind of keep, you know, the last time I, sure. I tried to, it yeah. cracked a little bit. Oh, I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah. So and the the stretch monster was alternative to stretch Armstrong. Right? He was he was the bad guy. Yeah. Yeah, he was the bad guy. I had stretch Armstrong and I cut him open. I cut open my stretch monster, the first yeah. one I had as a kid, as I yeah. had to see what was in him. I did too. I had to figure out what was going on in there, how they did that, and how it, how it works. And it was like it was a mount vinyl or something like that, or it was like a a it was like a reddish jelly yeah. like yeah. like really sticky it, it was looked a bad like move. candy i almost wanted to eat it i yeah. think it's hot melt vinyl or something like that we used it for stuff at steve johnson's all the time i'm sure those items will be in an upcoming episode of the daily collection at some point i'm sure since i'm talking about them i may because i was thinking what should my next item be maybe i should just pull one of those guys down and Oh yeah. And be very disappointed with what's inside the box now because <laughs> uh, I, I got a feeling it's, if I, if I look and the, the sleeve is still on, yeah, I'm not going to attempt to roll it. No, up. Don't, no, no, no. Are uh, the microchips still in there under oh, the sleeve? Dude, thing was oh. mint. Thing was, oh, wow. thing was, I mean, when you see this, it's, well, if you ever want to sell that, let me know. I'm looking for a Bigfoot. Man. Oh, a Bigfoot. I I'm looking that. for a Bigfoot and a Maskatron. The Bigfoot the, is the big money one. I had, you I had a Bigfoot, man. I don't know what happened to it. Dude, if you can find a Bigfoot in the box, yeah. over a grand. Really? That's not much. I thought it'd be more. I have my $6 million man lunchbox with the thermos still. Wow. It's pretty sweet. Um, I was a huge $6 million man fan, if you can't tell. I was obsessed with it when television was you know there wasn't all the content you have now and the shows like that that were on you tuned in because you know there was no syndication or anything you know they they were on and they were on and they went away and the other thing was is you knew when to tune in when six million dollar man or when the incredible hawk was going to turn in the car it was always 15 <clears> minutes <throat> into the show 45 minutes you know 40 45 minutes in the show they always did something bionic or turned into the hall or something twice in the show yeah sometimes you got lucky it, they ended on a cliffhanger with it but it was twice in it so you always knew when to tune in and i was obsessed with that stuff Dude, I love the Incredible Hulk. 
Mm-hmm. Oh um, yeah. Going back to sort of like the surreal thing. I'm now friends with Lou Ferrigno. And every time I see him, he mentions Twilight Zone because of my tattoos. Oh, right. Yeah. So every time he'll go, Sean, Sean, do you remember the episode when blah, blah, blah. And he'll, you know, and I'll be like, <laughs> yeah, Lou. Yeah. That's he pretty loved, great. Yeah. And it's, it's, I remember when I was a little kid and I first went to Universal Studios, I was probably eight, nine years old, something like that. And they had the truck that you could lift up. Like, mm-hmm, you could, mm-hmm. and, and I was a little kid and I got to lift the truck. Mm-hmm. I was so stoked. All right, guys. Well, thank you for your questions and everything. And uh, we are going to get back into the Robert Russler interview, the conclusion. And again, we apologize for the, the screen thing. It's going to be single screen. This will be the last time that happens. We got that fixed. No more of that nonsense. But we don't want to lose great content and a great interview. So deal with it. Chris put in a lot of time doing research. Uh, <laughs> and we got it sorted. And my buddy Lawton helped us out. And uh, hopefully things will be fine from this point on. But these stories are so engaging that Robert Russell are about to tell you, especially the pooping story, which we're going <laughs> to kick off with. This is a funny story. And I'm not even a huge fan of yeah. poop humor. Uh, this is a good story. It's a really good story. So yeah. here it is. I could sit here for hours and listen to him. Uh, hours. So you know we have I'm a. Gonna I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give everybody listening a little treat. Here we go. Okay. I, I'm. I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna tell the I'm pooping story. Okay. <laughs> oh, dude. I, 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 I know I, this one. I want to tell you guys a little inside Hollywood Babylon about what it was like meeting and working with Robert Downey Jr. on Weird Science. Okay. So sit back, yeah, buckle in. We, we did the rehearsals in Universal Studios for two weeks. We shot all of the exteriors in Chicago, Skokie, Highland Park, some of it downtown Chicago. And then we came back and shot the rest of the interiors at Universal Studios. So one day after uh, lunch, coming back from the commissary, I was going to, uh, Robert and I had an adjoining trailer so in, in these honey wagons they'd get for actors, uh, you could p- close off a partition and have your own a private room, or you could open the partition and you could share a room, which is what we did. We, we shared a room, we shared pretty much everything, uh, even our dates. Anyway, uh, <laughs> one day I was coming back from the commissary and I heard uh, this faint uh, voice and it kind of went like, what in the hell? I was like, Bob, is that you? Bobby. Bobby. And I was like, dude, where are you? Help me. I need toilet paper. It's like, what? Dude. I open up the room to this actress's room. I'm going to go unmentioned for this moment. I open the door of the, of the trailer and I see Downey in the middle of the room, squatting, (laughs) hands to his ankles, shit, shit coming right out in the middle of the fucking carpet of the trailer, <laughs> fucking, the fucking pork and beans hanging down, the, her, everything <laughs> exposed, and he's like, I'm pooping. <laughs> I'm like, oh, dude, what are, what are you doing? And then he pees on the top like a little gravy fucking like, oh, <laughs> and he's like, oh. toilet paper. Toilet paper. It's like this dude is fucking insane. So now I'm an accomplice. I I run to our room. I get him a bunch of toilet paper. I run it back. I give him the toilet paper, and we jam back into our room. And we're watching TV like nothing happened. And I'm I still I'm just looking at him like, like who who is this guy? (laughs) Does that right? Boom 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 boom. Oh my God! Slam in our door, fucking door rips open. It's the actress. Which one of you motherfuckers <laughs> in my trailer? And I'm just like, oh shit! Like a woman scorned, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and Robert just looks at her with the straightest face and goes, "Somebody shit in your trailer?" <laughs> <laughs> 
slams the door. <laughs> Couple minutes later, boom, 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 boom. Door flies open. Joel Silver, the producer of the movie. You do not want to fuck with this guy. Like he's known as one of the hardest fucking producers in Hollywood, right? Yeah. Which one of you fucking assholes shit in this fucking actress's trailer? I'm trying to make a movie here. Robert, straight faced. Have no idea, Joel. We've just been watching TV. You know, I did see Wally Ward hanging out over there. Just fully scapegoats Wally Ward, right? Boom, he fucking slams the door. A couple minutes later, this light tap. Tap, 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 tap. Come in. Door opens. It's John Hughes. Hey, guys. Oh, my God. Somebody shit in someone's trailer. <laughs> like, down his face. Like, this same. Absolutely not. Bob, have we not been sitting here the whole time? Wally, we think Wally did it. Really? Wally Ward shit in this girl's trailer? He's like, I don't know. I mean, that'd be my guess. Like, <laughs> closes the door. Which one of you guys shit in the trailer? You know, it's like, <laughs> I, 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 I didn't even try to be funny. I was like, listen, I didn't do it. I'm no stoolie. And then oh, John goes, God. you think that's funny? I go, oh, I didn't. Excuse the pun, you know. Long story short, they, they just totally questioned me. They give the, the third degree to Downey. And I told them before he, like, he went in after me. I said, dude, you got to tell them the truth. They're going to blackball me. Like, they're really considering firing me. Like, you got to tell them that you did it. He's oh my like, God. got it handled. About five minutes, he comes back out. He's like, let's roll. I go, dude, did you tell him that you did it? And he goes, Wally did it. <laughs> 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 and it became this ongoing joke for you. Holly <laughs> Ward still is like, dude, you guys are assholes. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> that Listen, is an amazing story. That, well, that, a, that rolls perfectly into our segment because to this day, you still say Wally did it. What are you into, bro? <laughs> what are you into? Oh, man, I don't know if I want to say that publicly. <laughs> uh, you know really to be honest with you what i'm into right now is uh i'm like tim the tool man taylor man i got this whole like workbench i've been giving myself projects during the covid19 pandemic we've been really pretty strict about quarantining between my girl and i we have six kids three boys she has a son and a daughter and then we have a daughter together and I've just been tinkering and building and painting and reflooring. And I'm always at Ace and my home away from home, Home Depot. Ah, yes. and, I, and, I, and I'm just like totally into projects around the house, which I was never into before. And I really have gotten into it. I've been building my tools. I have one, two, three, four. I got five toolboxes full of tools that I just can't wait to get into in the morning. <laughs> and, uh, and the other thing I've been into is uh, the difference between raising three boys, three teen boys that surf and skate and fight and talk shit to this beautiful young little daughter that we have together, Mary Elena, <laughs> and how different raising boys are compared to a little girl. Yeah. She's totally melted my heart, man, and I'm totally into that. Oh, that's right? great. So right. that's what, it, what what I've been into lately. What are you into, bro? The great thing about what I do, too, man, is, like, my boys love horror movies. They love, like I said, surfing and skating. Big fans of thrashing. You know, listen, I've been friends with Downey 35 years or something like that, something crazy. And now he's Iron Man. When they hang with Robert, like, it's a super good treat for them. Right. You know, I've known Josh Brolin since we did Thrashing in 86. We're family. Right. But now, you know, he's freaking. Thanos. Hello. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, for, so for my kids, when Josh comes over and they hang out and they tussle with him, it's super special for them. And it makes me feel so good that we've remained this close. You know, I love Robert's son and his new kids. I grew up watching them from babies into adulthood. Josh, now is, they both started new families again. Like, I just had a baby at 54, man. Like, it's fucking awesome you know, <laughs> that, that we get to share that with each other 
and that we all love each other like that. And um, that's awesome. And it makes it super rewarding, you know, super rewarding yeah. to, to, to stay friends with people, not just because they're movie stars, but what makes them movie stars to begin with is that special, that X factor that they possess is the reason why they became movie stars. And that's the part that they get to share with my kids because, you know, they're stoked that they're Thanos and, and, and Iron Man, right? And many others. But more, more so, it's to get to know them on a personal level. And they go, no wonder why you're friends with my dad. No wonder why my dad loves you. That's amazing. That's really, that's the payoff of it all, isn't it? Absolutely. All that stuff. Yeah. Awesome. So you're a big horror fan yourself. Give us, you know, your top three favorite horror movies of all time. Halloween, Exorcist. And for me, because there may be better horror movies, but the one that impacted me when I was a kid and I saw it, man, it freaked me out, dude, is my, my grandfather took me to a triple feature. I remember the third movie. The first movie was The, the, uh, the Abominable Dr. Fibes. Oh, yeah. But the second movie that flipped <clears throat> me out that I have to say is my favorite because it just was the town that dreaded sundown. When we were I just talking movie, about that before yeah. you came on, actually. Yeah, we were. When I watched that movie as a kid, man, <laughs> it freaked me out. I got a little story for you. When I went to see that movie, there was a serial killer that was in LA called the Skid Row Slasher. There was this serial killer that was killing homeless people, mostly down in Skid Row. So they named him the Skid Row Slasher. And we had gone to see this movie, The Town of Dread Sundown, downtown LA, when downtown LA movie theaters were still rocking. And I went to the bathroom during the movie because I was scared and I needed to like shit myself. <laughs> I went to the bathroom and it was totally empty. And I was at the urinal taking care of my business. And I heard this noise and I turned around and I saw these two feet step down from the toilet, you know, where you can see it underneath. Yeah. And I remember like, fucking totally panicking and running back up to the theater practically in tears and i told my grandfather the skid row slashers in the bathroom <laughs> everybody in the theater was like Shh. my grandfather's like you shut up <laughs> he didn't realize that the movie was going to be so scary he goes come on let's go home I go, no, no no i want to see the rest of the movie first because uh, the skid row slasher decided to not at that moment, not kill someone who's homeless on the street. And he was going after a kid in the bathroom. Yeah, he wasn't about to fuck with my papa either. That's for no, sure. Right. <laughs> Did I remember in the 80s when the Night Stalker thing was happening, Richard yeah. Ramirez. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I remember being terrified, man, because yeah. we used to sleep with our bedroom windows open all the time. But yeah, it was like, shut the window, man. That dude will come yeah. cruising in because he was killing right around us. You know, oh, yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. in Orange and County. It, and at yeah. random, it, there yeah. was no rhyme or reason to it. Yeah. You just sneak into homes. And in fact, that. I live where I live right now is just a couple miles from one of the houses he killed the whole family at. Wow. wow. Yeah. Or, or, you know, it might be the one he actually got caught at oh, in wow. Mission Viejo. That might be the one he got caught at, but but I know he killed the people, uh, killed some people there. Yeah, that's crazy, dude. I, I got another story that just came to mind, man. Like, kind of confirmed to me that intuition and instinct are real. Short of it is, I had a date with this girl Nikki, super fly, man, back in the day, and uh, I made a date with her, and I went to go pick her up. And she lived up in uh, Benedict Canyon. I pull up to this beautiful house, kind of primp in to knock on the door, and I knew her her mom or dad or whatever were going to be there. It was like that, you know, I was about 18, 19, something like that. Before I went into the house, I went over to the outside faucet where they have the hose hook up and I put a little water on my hands and, you know, fixed my hair. And I remember I got this really weird, really strange feeling, like sixth sense. Yeah, got a little, a little spooked, if you will. Hmm. And I, I remember turning around and I look up like this and I see a house up on top of the hill in the distance with the light on. Didn't think much of it, but just happened to look up to this house. And I was like, whatever, you know, I don't believe in ghosts, whatever. I turn off the water and I kind of just like scurry off from there and I knock on the door and I meet her dad and she's coming down from the stairs right out of a movie. You know, she's walks down the stairs. She looks gorgeous. And where are you going to take her? And, uh, 
I, I happened to say, you know, it was kind of weird. Like um, we were talking about the house, whatever, and nice house, you know, Mr. Kramer and something strange happened. I, I was out there in the front, you know, and I used a faucet and I got this weird feeling and I looked up and I told him what I just described to you. And he looked at his daughter and she looked at him and they looked at me and I was like, what, what? And he goes, uh, that faucet was a crime scene before we bought this house. It's where the Manson, uh, oh, I knew that's what you were going to say. Had murdered Polanski's wife, Sharon Tate. That's the house up there wow. on the hill that you looked at. That's Roman Polanski's house. Wow. And here is where they supposedly, after the murders, had come to wash the blood. And they used that. And they told us before we bought the house, like they had to like give us that information. Yeah. But people still come to see the house and, you know, looky lose or whatever. And that flipped me wow. out. Of course it did. That is crazy. How does that happen? Like years later that you get this spooky feeling. And when he told me that, man, like I almost, I almost didn't want to date her. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's wow. That's a great story. Wow. Now, that is crazy. That's weird. Yeah. That shit exists, man. That shit's real. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, I've yeah. only had one sort of paranormal type of incident, really. I mean, I've had weird shit happen, but I've only had one thing totally unexplained that's happened to me. A friend of mine, and this was during, when I was in high school, a friend of mine was killed in a car crash. I came home that day after finding out, and I remember walking in the house, and this, you know, this is 1986, 87, I think, 87. And I remember I walked in the house and my routine was I walk into the kitchen. I look at the answer machine because we used to have answer machines back in the day. And it had a little <laughs> digital display and it said zero. There was no, no messages. And I turned around and I walked. The kitchen was connected to the living room. I'm talking 10 feet away. I walked in the living room and I remember just kind of, I was crying and I like looked up and I'm just like, you know, if you can hear me, give me a sign I'm talking to my dead friend and nothing happens. I'm standing there for maybe two minutes. I turn around, I walk back into the kitchen and the light is flashing. The phone never rang. You know, back in the day, dude, answer machines, when that thing went on, <laughs> you could hear that shit. You know what I mean? There's no way a message silently rolled in. Yeah. And I'm like, what the fuck, right? I hit play, it was just static. It was this Some poltergeist shit. Dude, wow. I freaked, man. And I don't believe in that shit. <laughs> but you shit. asked for it. I love how you go, just send me a sign. What yeah. the fuck? Remember <laughs> <laughs> what you asked for, right? You asked yeah, for I, it. But I'll tell you what, I mean, yeah. That's I awesome. still, that's the only thing that's ever happened to me that's like that. I was in a, a stay in a very old hotel, actually kind of known for being haunted. And I was sleeping at night and I woke up hearing something and the bathroom light was on and it wasn't on when I went to bed. I looked in the bathroom, I stood up, I heard something. I saw a naked boy covered in blood run from the bathroom across the room and out the window. And it freaked me the fuck out. Like I was, I was yeah, awake. I think it would. I was awake. I wasn't dreaming it. I was awake. And I freaked out and I rushed back to the back of the headboard of the bed, you know, like going, what the flying fuck is going on? Looking, looking, looking like this. And I remember looking back here, back there, nothing at the window, back to the um, bathroom, light was off, nothing. It was a dark room. And I just remember seeing that kid covered in blood running with the light on. It freaked me out. When I went downstairs the next morning, I was talking and the guy behind the desk of the hotel said, oh yeah, people see stuff at this hotel all the time. It's a very haunted hotel. But yeah, that's my paranormal story. Wow. John's pretty fearless, man. We went to that haunted uh, asylum. Uh, what was that, Kentucky, John? Oh yeah, what was that place called? Um... I know what you're talking about. That place is, yeah. Dude, the scariest part of the whole little tour we were on like the where they put the dead bodies right and there's just like yeah the the drawers the, yeah and i was like the morgue they, they were and yeah. they said i dare you to get into to, to the drawer we'll take a picture and and i <laughs> like literally i was like oh hell no and sean's like i'll do it <laughs> and we put him in the drawer well, and then we open the drawer was but dude, you, no remember they said who would get in there and stay for yeah. like five minutes and yeah. you guys put me in and you guys left. 
And totally. I just laid in there for like five minutes by myself. <laughs> Waverly Hills Sanitarium. <laughs> Waverly Hills. That was yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> and remember, we were there with Tyler Maine. Remember, he was with us. Yeah. Tyler Maine was with us, and yeah. Bob Elmore was there. Yeah. That was fun that day. We had that a was lot fun. of fun. That place was spooky, though. That was cool. That was really cool. I love going to old abandoned buildings like that and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> another another movie that really I loved, uh, which. I mean, I guess it is one of my favorites, but man, when I saw the first time Dawn of the Dead with my buddies, we were all in seventh grade, I believe. My friend Craig's mom dropped us off at the theater in Marina Del Rey, and we saw Dawn of the Dead. We played Dawn of the Dead every day, bro. Like, <laughs> I would have a machete and an AR, and that, the other day, like, I would have a shotgun. Like, it was so cool yeah when we saw that movie for the first time because it was exciting and funny and you know it just it just totally wowed our imagination i too got the privilege of meeting george romero at a convention always through sean i was with sean at a convention and i met romero and uh he was the nicest guy yeah and i told him you know listen i'm not much of a fanboy, but i told him about how much fun I had as a boy with my friends after Dawn of the Dead and seeing it 94 times. <laughs> and, uh, and it was just a real, it was just a real honor to meet him because he was a great dude. He Chris great got guy. to see it being filmed. I did uh, the Dawn of the original Dawn of the Dead. Pretty cool, man. <clears throat> I was, well, I, like I said, I grew up outside of Pittsburgh and, it, and the Monroeville mall where they shot the movie. That's where we would go shopping before school started every year. It was like, okay, you gotta go to the mall, gotta get your tough skin jeans. Cause I was like, cause I was, <laughs> do you remember tough skin jeans? Dude, by the I, that remembers that? Those are very embarrassing. To, when very I embarrassing. To get, cause when I was chubby. I was husky. Yeah. yeah husky. It was the husky department. Yeah. And, and I had so the I tough had, skins too. I had I the tough skins men. because they were reinforced between the legs and the knees. <laughs> because i was it can still come in handy to this day for those reasons <laughs> that's true <laughs> so i was husky yeah. so we would just go to monroeville mall i get my clothes and, and you know that was the thing i was at school and over the hill of the school there was a truck depot i can't remember what it's called right now there's a truck depot and they were shooting the scene where they steal all the semi trucks and they run over all the zombies and you know tom savini gets hit and flies and you know they're they're stealing the semis to go block off the monroeville mall which is a completely different town than yeah. where, where where monroeville was anyway my school was up on the hill and after school one day we were like what's going on so we all walked down the hill and they had it kind of cordoned off not like they do these days but you know kind of half-assed and you could see and they're doing stuff and there are people in blue makeup walking around and this is the, and then george romero came over and he said hi to us and he's like well blah, blah blah and he was talking and i said oh one of these days i want to i want to work on movies like this i i'm gonna work on movies like this and i think i was uh, eight or nine years old i think it was after elementary and uh he's like oh good for you blah blah he's all really nice to us and then cut two years later first thing i worked with him on was uh, the dark half and then subsequently land of the dead and stuff and i walked up and i go do you remember talking to a bunch of kids on dawn of the dead and he goes yeah i kind of remember i mean he didn't totally remember but he didn't remember i said i told you i was going to work for you one day i was going to work for you and work on your movies and sure enough all those years later i ended up working with george romero it was amazing that's pretty but, cool uh, that's a good yeah. story you too can do anything you set your mind to. I used to go with my dad to work, you know, at Universal. But one of the things that really stuck out with me is, um, is Pete was the head of special effects. I don't know his last name, but um, I just knew him as Pete. And he said to me one day, you want to see something pretty cool? And I said, of course. And he took me into this uh, locked down in uh, stage 27. And he opened this uh, vault door inside the stage and then there was this big tarp that was covering something and had all these uh, wires connected to it and, and all these controls to manipulate what was under the tarp. And he pulled the tarp back and revealed to me Bruce the shark from Jaws. Oh. <laughs> now, mind you, this is before Jaws came out. Oh, wow. They had finished their shooting in Martha's Vineyard and they had come back. My dad was working on Jaws, but he didn't work on it on location but he was working on it in the studio when Spielberg was, was, was doing post and he showed me the shark 
and man, like, like I knew, like I wanted to do, I want, I, at first, my, my first idea is that I was going to work in special effects because Pete said, if you finish high school, you know, and you get good grades, you know, there's a job waiting here for you. Oh, wow. In that time, you know, as time progressed, I had also met stuntmen through my dad and I wanted to be a stuntman and, you know, there's all these things. And then finally becoming an actor was all those things wrapped up into one. You know, I knew that by becoming an actor, I, I got to, you know, experience every facet of the business. And, and I've just been so fortunate to be able to work with so many great people over the years, a lot of whom are no longer with us, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, I'll always remember, you know, being, um, you know, honored and privileged enough to work with these great people. It's pretty cool, isn't it? That's Very awesome. cool. That's super cool. I, I mean, know. just your whole arc of being a kid and being connected to Universal and then your dad and then growing older and then working at Universal and I did like the whole my, my first movie there the destiny of my it was first amazing. TV series there you know wow. just ironically enough the first day I showed up to work at Universal after we had shot in Chicago it was funny because I rolled up in the Z28 that Joel had, had rented <laughs> for me. I used to step on the brake and hit the gas and I'd fucking go through a, a set of tires like every week. But um, I rolled up that morning and uh, they were like a couple proud parents, you know. They had given me my first movie. They taft hartley me. And what that yeah. means is um, back in the day, you know, when you get your first uh, acting gig, when you become a member of SAG, they taft hartley you and you're officially a member of the Screen Actors Guild. So I rolled up to work and they were standing out there and, you know, good morning. And I was like, hey, good morning. And, and John was very cool and very warm and knew what a big deal it was for me to get this job. And he's like, let me, let me show you to your trailer, you know? And I was nice. like, great, you know? And, uh, and meanwhile, one of the drivers, Silent Gus, said, hey, Rustler, you little cocksucker, what are you doing here? <laughs> and, and Joel and John looked at each other and then here comes Russ. He's like, hey, bitch, I heard you got a job, right? <laughs> and, and they're like, how do you know these people? And on cue, my dad like totally embarrassed me. He's like, son, I'm on the movie. I'm on the movie. I'm on your movie, right? <laughs> and they're looking like, I go, oh, that's my dad. You know, uh, he's a teamster. Like I grew up here. Oh, that's cool. You know, so my very first day, you know, on the movie, like I'm already hanging out with all the teamsters they're dutch rubbing me going you little <laughs> you, don't deserve this shit, you know that's, awesome. that's a great story the universal is a magical place for me man it i love is. it i just yeah. love it. when i was doing the outsider series we used to steal the golf carts and uh get chased by the security guys for fun and, uh, <laughs> and i i used to fuck with the with the tours you know they they'd be coming by and uh I, I mooned the, the tram one time and I got in a lot of trouble for it. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, and RJ Lewis, he, he was a producer of the show. Uh, him and Coppola were, were, were pretty pissed that I had, you know, mooned the tram. And so RJ <laughs> says to me, he says, did you know, you, you moon the tram, you know, that's, that's, that's not cool. Like you could get fired for shit like that. And I was like, well, R Richard Burton pissed on it once. I mean, it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> You're not Richard Burton, asshole. <laughs> it won't happen again. <laughs> we were just talking about Universal in the last episode and, you know, how we we're both so bummed that it looks like Halloween isn't going to happen this year because of COVID, you know, and every year I go to Halloween Horror Nights at Universal and not Scary Farm. And Man, no Halloween? Yeah. I mean, we we got to get our shit together. That's what I'm the most pissed about. I'm yeah. honestly, is that there's not going to be a Halloween, man. Oh man! I mean, I was I'm I'm, I'm people are I'm, dying and well, there's that. It's going off. No, no, I mean, no. <laughs> there's that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that sucks too. But but, but there's my no fucking Halloween, Halloween man. <laughs> Let's be honest with you. And there's no ways that Halloween Horror, I mean, fuck, the world coming to. I just, I just, I appreciate being on the show with you guys. I, I appreciate being able to talk a little bit about my experience and, and, uh, and, you know, not censor like who I am and, and some of the shit that I've done. And that's why Sean and I think we get along so well and we, why we do Horrors Hollow Grounds and we have these ongoing jokes and we fuck with each other in the, in the show. 
and, yeah. and, and, you know, that's, what's cool about it is we can break each other's balls, but I know that if I needed Sean, that he would be there for me. And I think he knows the same of me, you know, it's like, um, it's like, I was, that's why I named a couple of those specific guys that I've remained friends with all these years. There's that bond that never goes away. And yeah. even, even when time passes, it's like no time has passed when you see each other again. Yeah. Uh, unlike other, you know, relationships where, you know, you have your friends and then you have your acquaintances, right? And sometimes with acquaintances, you kind of got to catch up and, 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 and kind of rekindle or whatever. And with friends, it's like no time has passed at all because we already kind of know each other so well. You don't have to know everything about somebody to, to know what their core is like, you know? Yeah. And that's what's, that's what's cool about being friends with guys like Sean, you know? Like, that's awesome. He's just a fucking awesome individual. And that's why I'll always down I'm choking I'm up. Down. I'm always down I'm, to do a show. I'm choking <laughs> up. I'm choking up. I'm choking up. <laughs> I told myself I wouldn't cry. I'm just going to do a Scott Bayo for you guys right now. I told myself I wouldn't cry. Uh, <laughs> fucking you're the best, bro. Uh, I told myself I wouldn't cry. I told myself. Well, That's awesome. I don't think there's any any way better to end it than on that note on how great I am. Um, I, That's true. <laughs> what about me, though? You guys and then are, there's Chris. And then there's So me. thanks for everybody watching. Um, See you, everybody. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> What's next, man? Let's talk about what's next. I guess the whole point is, is that this is fucking up my Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> there are those moments where things are lining up and they're supposed to, and, you know, it could come back. It sometimes might, you know, they come back. Sometimes they come back, man. Sometimes they come but back I, again. Yeah, sometimes they come back for more. Sometimes <laughs> they never fucking left. Why is the original Halloween so fucking good? All the Halloween series... That's it's a whole good. episode. I'm a, That's I'm, a whole I'm a, yeah. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. But why was the first one? And I think for me, to share with the horror fans, which are the fucking greatest fans in the world, by the way, movies like the first Halloween put that impact. Like I was talking Town of Dreaded Sundown, the first time I saw Dawn of the Dead, the first time I went to go see Halloween with my buddies, and we went to the theater. My mom dropped us off that night. We went in this, you know, scarfed out popcorn, uh, probably smoked about an ounce of weed, and then <laughs> and, like got the munchies and watched Halloween and the music and Michael Myers and fucking Donald Pleasant's creepy ass, like everything about it just it impacts you. And I think that's what's so great about why horror fans are so uh, loyal is, you know, you weed through all of it and you can have fun with all of it. And every once in a while, something comes along, which reiterates why you're a horror fan. You know, the first nightmare, you know, the first Halloween, uh, you know, in this case, Dawn of the Dead. And um, man, I'm just such a fan myself, you know. I can't wait for things to get back rolling and, and get back to work because that's maybe one of the things that happens when shit like this goes down is it, it, it gets you hungry again and you realize that you don't want to take anything for granted. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good point. It's a reset button. Honestly, it's yeah. a reset button for me. Not that I needed to be reminded of that, but it really has energized me. Like I'm a hermit and I don't really socialize a whole lot. I'm not, I like, I like my world and I stay in it and I'm okay. You guys can all have your shit. I'm going to be over here, but uh, I'm ready to go back to work, man. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to do some, I want to make some stuff and make some movies and, you know, Halloween was a big thing. Getting the Halloween 2018 was huge for me. Uh, Halloween kills being pushed now to next year is a, is a huge bummer, but yeah, man, I want to get back to work. want to get those creative juices going. And I think ultimately just make stuff for people to enjoy. That's the thing. Like, yeah. And you know what else I miss is actually enjoying, man. I'm going to go back to the goddamn movie theater and see some yeah. movies again. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Me too. I'm sick of you porn. I mean, oh, YouTube. I mean, you too. <laughs> well, the yeah. Halloween, going back to what your question was, is what makes that movie so amazing is, is uh, so many things that, again, we could go on for for hours. I know I could, but, but in a nutshell for me, it's like, it was the perfect storm. Yeah. 
at the perfect time, there wasn't a movie made about Halloween with the name Halloween up until that point, which is amazing. Yeah. When you yeah. think about it. And having John Carpenter and having Jamie Lee Cur it was the perfect storm. And it also is the epitome of, you know, when people say, leave something to your imagination. You know, you gotta leave something for the audience to project onto the screen that isn't gratuitous and you don't see it. It's not all there. You have to fill in the blanks with your imagination. That movie is really a testament of making people fill in blanks with their imagination. And that's what makes the movie so great. It's what makes the shape the shape. It what makes all those dark pockets and 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 black spots throughout the entire movie and the lack of the gore and the lack of the action that you see, you fill it in and you remember it being more than what it is. It's the epitome of that, of, of any film. I agree. And you know, it's another thing I miss is I call it the iconic psychotic, you know, the Michael Myers, the Freddy Kruegers, the Leatherface, the Hellraiser. There's, there's, they, I miss that lately. And I want to do like an 80s throwback style of that. And that's why I created this character, Leonard Gorman. I want to really reintroduce another great psychotic, iconic psychotic. I said best name I can think of it. And, and yeah. Michael was the best. I just yeah. thought that's why I think that I've named Halloween first as my favorite because I just think that he, he, he's so far to me, he's my favorite, you know, yeah. because of the mystery. Yeah. Just, uh, it's what you it's what's that's what so many filmmakers and horror writers and makers get wrong is that it's what you don't know about them that yeah. makes them great. It's not what you know about them, it's yeah. what you it's don't a, know. It's pretty so, cool. It really yeah. is. And that's where I think the the remakes kind of failed. They yeah. it over explained everything. The Rob yeah. Zombie versions, which you know, I don't hate the Rob Zombie film. I'm not a fan of the second one at all. And I appreciate he tried to do something different and I appreciate what he did. But what I loved about that series and that character was not knowing, was the, mis the mystique is what, you know. Um, but what you're saying about the iconic psychotic, uh, I think one of the, the key elements, unfortunately, I mean, story is important, but the key element is design. It's all comes down to, to, to make the next horror icon, it, it's going to be up to a guy like Chris that has to come up with a look that's going to resonate with horror fans. And, you know, cause so many people have tried well, and this, failed, you know. It's a good point, Sean. And, and it leads me to this. Mm -hmm. The best directors I've ever worked with are not dictators. You know, you have to have somebody in charge. Two things about a director. They're the most unneeded and the most needed person on the set. Because if you don't have a director, it's like too many cooks in the kitchen. And why you need a director, you know, so badly is you got to have somebody that can make the decisions and allow everybody to do what they're good at, right? That's why John was great with actors. Mm -hmm. He was also the same way with camera and hair and makeup. And it, it go down the line of each, of, of each department. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what makes the best director to me, and, and it goes with what you're saying, is when you cast a movie you don't just cast the actors you cast the crew and when you can get a great crew to come in and you go listen here's my idea here's my vision run with it and then let's boil it down and let's let's collaborate together to make the final decision and you do that in each area what it really does is you're giving everybody the uh, freedom to do what they do and not try to do everybody's job for them. There's a nice line that gets crossed. I mean, and the best directors I work with, they do it effortlessly. Another great director that I worked with that was like that was the, he's an actor director named Bill Duke. And, and working with him and really seeing how he sort of directs and or guides the set has really inspired me to do just that. You got to get each department and allow them the freedom to utilize their expertise. And I mm -hmm. think that's what goes with proper pre-production. Is know? that the guy from The Predator? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Great director. Guys. Okay. So, so good, good actor too. He's the character that that um, I see you, motherfucker. Go hand me some fun. Go hand me some fun. Yeah. Wasn't he just fun. in, uh, he was just in Mandy, wasn't he? 
also. Mm -hmm. was, yeah. I, I think, think, so. I think yeah. so. But it, it, you're right. It is all pre-production and who you choose because the idea, what makes a great craftsperson or an artist or of, of any level or any kind, be it above the line or below the line on a film and what makes a great director and producer is finding people that are able to not only connect with the vision of the director, what they're trying to accomplish and to be able to contribute to the context of what that person is trying to see and bring their spice into that, bring their knowledge into that. That's yeah. what makes a good film artist is to go, what do you want to do? Okay, I get it. I think this will work for your vision because it is collaborative, but yet ultimately it's the director's vision, but you want to be able to spice that vision up and, and have use your knowledge to go. This is, this is what I think is going to work within the context of the story that you're trying to tell. And that's what yeah. makes a good crew member. That, absolutely you know, you know, so. absolutely yeah the only way i can come back and and finish this interview is if you promise to do a horror's hallowed grounds on nightmare on elm street part two oh yeah well it's been great talking to robert rustler <laughs> um, <laughs> I can't wait. Oh, wait. did you hear that robert england wants to do a remake of the gayest horror film ever made, Nightmare on Elm Street Part Two. You texted me the article. I yeah. couldn't believe it. It's real. He's not joking. Wow. I'm going to show you guys real quick. Really? Let's see. I'm looking it up right here. Boom. And there it is. All right. I mean, I don't know if you can believe everything you read on the internet. Does he want to remake it gay or does he want to remake it not gay? Well, if you if you oh, check out oh. this article, it's actually really interesting. You know, Robert, for you guys that maybe don't know, Robert England's very sharp, you know? Very yeah, no, he is. He has a very interesting outlook on how it should be remade, utilizing some of the things that were really unique and interesting about part two, because regardless of what you think about the series or part two or comparing one to four or what... Two was the last one where he remained dark before he kind of got commercial and kind of one-liner yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And two was is my favorite Freddy Krueger, actually. Part two is my favorite version of Freddy Krueger. It's dark. Makeup. It looks yeah. all of it. Oh, really? I think oh, he was here's dark, a, here's cooler. A from, here's a quote from Robert England. The secret of Nightmare on Elm Street is the loss of innocence and the kids need to be like Midwestern kids. They can't be hip, chic, junkie kids they have to be middle american kids that think they're a little hip and they are co-opted by evil and they lose their innocence on all levels sexual violence murder death the realization of their parents flaws all those things but because our society now is more damaged because of the opioid crisis because of the openness now with gender and sexuality those kids now have to be different than the kids from the original. Someone has to write a different batch of kids and Freddy needs to be a different kind of evil. His evil needs to be. He needs to toy with that in the culture and really deal with the subtext. Freddy toying with that boy's sexuality. But the fact that we're much more comfortable with that now, I think it would be really fun to have Freddy play with one kid who's gay. Maybe one boy who is not play with them, tempt them, force them out of the closet or back into the closet. And when we can do that, audiences would accept that now. Freddie would do that because he's in your head. But is it going to take somebody very clever to do that? I think yes. There it is. I agree. That's a really good take on it. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's taking it back to the psychological and what is going to be the most horrifying in the time that we live in right now. And that would be it. Hold on. Before, before we end this, I want to show everybody my baby. This is Mary Elena. Oh, oh, hey. no. Mary? oh what a cutie. Wow. <laughs> you made that. <laughs> Man, I got it right out man. of my balls. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you don't see that when you're older. <laughs> I love you Thank guys. You. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Robert. Yeah. I appreciate it. Horror fans, love you guys. All right, Most man. horror fans in the world. I'll be in touch soon, my friend. All right, look out for my next movie, Jacob's Wife. Jacob's Wife, everybody. Uh, Thank you, Robert. That was Barbara awesome. Frampton. Love you guys. Oh, nice. Thank you.
All right. But see you, man. That was so cool. I could have him back again and talk forever. He's so awesome. And there's so many stories. And so we'll have to have him back to do redo the weird science stuff. I, I think it's just another episode. You know what I mean? The weird science and John Hughes section that we, I think we lost. Yeah. Was amazing. So yeah. we have to come back and do that. So hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, now we know the questions to ask because we heard the stories already. Exactly. Anyway, thank you guys for joining us. Leave your comments down below. Subscribe. Tell your friends. Post on social media. You can find both of us on Instagram, I believe, and him on Facebook, yada, yada. Leave your comments. Have questions. We're going to have another guest. We already have our next guest lined up. I'm not going to go into should it. Should we announce it? Why don't we announce it? Go ahead. You do it. Oh, so next week, we will have Mr. Nick Castle on, the shape himself. The original shape, and Nick Castle. So we'll, we'll focus a little bit on uh, Halloween next next episode, maybe. Yeah, that'll be fun. So come so, back next week when we do Nick Castle and we talk about more stuff. Thank yeah. you, Sean. Thank you, Chris. Tougher. Chris, tougher. I know you right. like that better. Duh. All right. Bye. Something like that. That sounds good. Okay, cool. Let me see if this shit works. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll text you. All right, let me know. All right, bye.